Hello and welcome to another very special edition of the Blue Monday podcast. I'm Craig Fimbo and joining me is an Ipswich Town legend twice over. I'm delighted to welcome a man who not only finds himself fifth in the list of highest ever appearance makers for Ipswich Town, he also managed the third most matches in our history. A very, very warm welcome to George Burley. George, how are you going? I'm good, thank you. Yeah, yeah, enjoying a nice sunny morning. Just walked the dog, so um, yeah, I'm all on re- all realm to go. Perfect. So the plan is, given your length of service, that we'll have a chat about your playing career and then about your managerial career afterwards, if that's okay. Yeah, that sounds good. So, well, where do we where do we start then? 1972, do we start in? 71. 71. That's when you came down and joined Ipswich, was it? And yes. how on earth how on earth did that come about? Well, I mean, um, we'll go and talk more about Sir Bobby um, as um, time goes on with the interview. But, um, you know, Sir Bobby put a sort of plan ahead, ahead of his time to try and bring players, young players from all over the country. And that and that, and that was Scotland as well. Scotland, the North East, the Midlands, everywhere, really. Uh, and they organised trials uh, near my home place in Cumnock. Um, which actually is near Glenbuck. If anybody's seen the the, the program at Glenbuck and Netflix about um, Liverpool um, and Bill Shankly, um, I lived near there. So there was trials, and I was um, you know did okay, and they invited me down. I think it was Easter. Me and uh, a number of other Scottish lads. Uh, so we played trials, and after that trial, I was lucky enough to. Um, been invited um, to sign an apprenticeship, um, so it was a big decision. So the trials I was only fourteen. Uh, I played Scottish schoolboys, um, and I had a few offers from local clubs like Air United and um, Kamarnock, uh, where I lived. Um, so it was something I had to think about. Um, there was another boy called Kenny Taylor, same age, and he was from Salkets uh, in Ayrshire as well, and he was invited. Um, so I spoke to my parents. They, they, you know, they were keen for me to stay on at school and and try and progress. But they knew I wanted to do it, and they felt that they couldn't stand in my way. So myself and Kenny Taylor signed, and we were the two first ever Scottish boys to to sign apprenticeship uh, for Ipswich. And then that was at the age of fifteen. I was uh, fifteen on the third of June, and I think I, I came to Ipswich on about the twenty fifth of June, nineteen seventy one. Wow. Seems a long time ago, and it was um, a big decision, but it was one I, I never regretted. But and so then, presumably, you had to live in live in digs, and you know, had a had the life of a an apprentice, basically. So, what were you, were you well looked after in those days? Yeah, um, I mean, Ipswich was you know under Sabobi and the club and the Cobalt was such a family club, um, and there was other youngsters there from all over the country. And um, you know we're a very tight bond. Um, you know we we you know Ipswich is a very vibrant place and uh, we were very friendly. And we all played and we played in the southeast counties. Uh, you know where the where the Astra pitch is now. Um, um, in the mornings and we used to get good crowds and we had a very good team. So we were very you know great coaches. You know Cyril Lee, Bobby Ferguson, then Charlie Woods came. Um, and Ron Gray, who was a big character, Ron Gray said that I, I was a frying pan signing <laughs> 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 because I lived in the little council house with my mum and dad, and, and there was a tiny wee kitchen, and they put the form on in the little unit right next to the frying pans. So Ron called it, it was a frying pan signing. <laughs> <laughs> so he ca- he came all the way up to Scotland to get you to sign the forms, did he? Yes, he did. Uh, Ron, there was another boy called George Finlay, who was the chief scout in Scotland, who 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 brought a lot of good players like you know, uh, you know Johnny Wark and Alan Brazil, 
so um, yeah, so that, so that was the start of the uh, frying pan signing and and progressed um, through the youth team and it was very competitive for southeast counties. Yeah, um, you know, which really was tough and uh, but it was very very enjoyable. I would say the first six months, there was no doubt I was homesick. Um, and, you know, I had the other Scottish boy with us who who helped. Um, but this first six months uh, as a 15 year old and uh, and I had other problem was nobody could understand the word I said. <laughs> now I've lost my Scottish accent being a stiff up boy. We've knocked we've knocked the edges off slightly, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that that but um, the football wise it was great. I, I mean I love football, I love training, and uh, I really enjoyed it. And um, things were going quite well on the field, but yeah, initially it was difficult to settle. Yeah, cool. Understandably, at that age, isn't it? So, you, as you say, you played Southeast Counties League for a season or two, but yeah, it, yeah, it wasn't... I was. Oh, sorry, I was very lucky because I won the Southeast Counties Player of the Year. Uh, mm-hmm. One big disappointment I had, it was uh, presented to us in London, and Bobby Moore was supposed to be coming and present me. That was in nineteen, I think, seventy-three, uh, but unfortunately, he couldn't make it. So that was a disappointment. But you know, I was very pleased to win that prize. I think, I think I'm the only kid from which it had won it so um, that was a big honour for me. Well to, to win that in 1973 you must have been 16, 17, 16, 17 years old yeah because that's and then 1973 obviously is when you started to make your way into the into the first team and a bit of a baptism, baptism of fire was it at, uh, for your debut? Yeah I mean I had been playing the reserves and um, you know Charlie Woods was um, charged, and you know, and he, you know, Charlie had got on very well with, and he was promoting me. And there was a few injuries. Um, I think Jeff Hammond had been in the team because I think Mick Mills and uh, people was injured, um, and and then all of a sudden, Bobby said to me on the Thursday evening, I think, you know, bring bring your um, stuff in to stay overnight because you'll be travelling with us to to Manchester. And I thought. Oh, okay, you know, it'd be nice just to travel. I mean, I was only 17, Old Trafford, you know, all the, the well-known players, the fantastic international players they had. So then on the Friday morning, he says, how, how, how are you feeling? I feel good, enjoyed the training with the pros. And he didn't used to do much on a Friday morning. We actually used to use spikes, <laughs> nobody believe, for sprinting. And I oh, love that. Really? Because I, you know, I loved that because it was fairly quick, and I, I, I really loved running. So that that was different uh, from there. So he said, by the way, I don't know, is your parents come to the game? I said, well, you know, it's a long way, Bobby. I mean, they've only got a little car; it'll probably take them five hours. Oh well, just tell them that you're going to start the game. You'll be playing and that sort of. <laughs> so 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 I told them, and um, yeah, travelled up on the Friday for the game on the Saturday. Yeah. So come Saturday, we got just just um, to the ground, and the coach stops, and I can see Bobby walking up up uh, the bus for me. He said, "George, is your parents here?" I said, "Yeah, I phoned them, Bobby. It was going to take them five, six hours because the roads are not very good then to Scotland." Okay, where are they? And I said, "Well, I've just spotted them. They're just over there." I said, "Fine." So he got out of the bus, walked over to my parents, says, "Mr. And Mrs. Burley." They near there's two directors box tickets f- to watch the sun today. And that just stunned them up and um, you know, and that was you know, for me, it gave me such a high as well for my parents to be there. So um yeah, couldn't have been a better place to make your debut. Fantastic. And it couldn't have been against a better player? <laughs> yeah, well Joe's best and everybody. I mean, but it's seventeen year old, oh, I had no fear. <laughs> I'd one of these up uh, let me out there. You know that's how I felt, and um, and I went and played. <laughs> I um, I dropped, I'm sure I was nervous, but it was oh, I just think right, let me out. Um, that's what I wanted to do. I knew I was quick, and I knew I could get up and down the field. Whether I could cope with the talent, um, lucky for me, maybe just base. Yeah, it was one of his last games, and um, I always say yeah, I did quite well. He only not make me three times during the game, so I did okay. <laughs> but then after that game you barely missed a game well you played every match apart from one for the rest of that season yeah I mean that that's something I always tell you know look at um, managers and players 
And I'm sure there was times where during that spell, I may be having a bad game or nothing, but it's a Bobby believed in you and wanted to work in the training grounds. And if things didn't maybe go quite well, he said, you know, or Bobby Fegs or Charlie Woods or Cyril Lee would say, yeah, we've got to work on that. And and you learned yourself, you knew the things you had to work on and you got better. So that was the support you needed. So, uh, you know, um, I didn't say I played badly every game, but... <laughs> But as I say, it was it was great. So though that continuity and the, the, you know continual improvement, which was built up in it, which, and that's what we believed in every day. You know, Bobby Fegg says, well, you know, think about your game. Where did it wasn't perfect? If your left foot or your heading or that wasn't right, Monday morning, that's where it starts. That's where you actually improve it for the next game. And that is what the last game's over. The next game's the most important. It's, it's not just talking about um, number of matches, really. It wasn't just that season. It's every season now for the next seven, eight seasons, yourself and pretty much the majority of the squad are playing 40-plus games each year. Um, how did you know everyone manage to play so many games with no sports science and sports scientists and performance people tracking your every movement on a pitch and... Things like that. How how did we manage to just churn out so many matches as a unit? Number of factors. Um, every factor is very important. Uh, mentally, you've got to be tough. You've got to be strong. You've got to have the desire. You've got to have the dedication. You've got to have the belief. That's got to come. Then you've got you know the fitness side to keep that up. Um, I used to you know go out in the afternoons you know and and I was a fullback and I loves to go up and down as soon as paul cooper got the ball i was off or i was up and down and i was a very quick breaking quickly from the back yeah. so i used to have a, a weight jacket which we had in the club and two or three afternoons a week i used to go and that one practice ground we had you know you look at the practice areas of the training grounds they have now we i can't believe that we had three teams and we only had one area in the park across the road <laughs> and all three teams trained in that so I used to work in the afternoon at my sprinting. I'd go, right, box to box and do that for half an hour, two or three times a week. So that kept the strength and that belief. I remember speaking to like John Barnes once. He said, John, he said, I hate playing against you because I'm always chasing you. I never get the ball because I'm always chasing you back the way. So I felt that was the way to go. Let the winger work, you know, worry about me. And then, because I had put it into the training ground, and, and Bobby Ferguson used to always say, put it in the bank, because once you've done all that in training in the bank, you go out in the field feeling better, yeah. feeling stronger than your opponent. So it was a continual thing for the team. The whole team was the same. And, and you know, when I was a manager, whatever, you hardly see people after training doing extra. I think, what's going on here? Because we used to spend, because a manager can only do so much in a coach. Then after the group sessions, it's up to you to say, hang on, I need to there. You know, you know, you talk about Paul Marin, I bless him, whatever. I used to say, Paul, Paul said, right, just, you know, straight balls into me and bang. His control was unbelievable because he worked at it. You know, and I used to be quite a good pass the ball because I worked at it. Yeah. Sometimes about half hour earlier, like the, we had a big board at the training ground, just hitting right foot, left foot, just practicing it. So you take that on. So all those factors, you know, had to be there to make a top class side for the team. And and when you look at the players, look at the internationals in that team, oh, it was second to none. And that wasn't all natural. That wasn't big signings and, and players who were fantastic. It was a group of players wanting to improve and get better. Work hard, yeah. What do you say about it being a, a top class Top class group of players. We, you finished fourth in your first season as a as a after your debut, and then the following season, I think we finished third behind Derby and Liverpool. And famously, if it was three points for a win, we'd have won the league um, and lost in the semi-finals of the FA Cup to West Ham. But you were, you were now, yeah, you were now part <laughs> of the furniture. Probably. So, do you, do you remember much about the West Ham replay? I think it was we lost. Yeah. Um... I think um, 
I think I was struggling for the first game with my ankle, but I played and Bobby said you shouldn't have played because, you know, but I remember the replay and, I mean, I think, I mean, Chelsea weren't, I think wasn't my favourite place to play at and, and it was a close game, but the decisions went against us that day. You know, no doubt, I think um, Brian Hamilton keeps talking about it all the time. I think it was handball and he didn't actually handle it. But it never happened. Um, and it went close at that period. It had been great to get um, a bit farther. But um, yeah, it was a, we were competing and we're very unfortunate not to get there. I think was it the West Ham ended up winning it. Was it against Fulham in the final? Yeah, I um, yeah, I think they, they, it was a it was a game where yeah. you would expect to win the final, and um, unfortunately, it wasn't for us. But um, again, we were there, thereabouts, cups and leagues every season. But and you know, you're 18 years old in that in that in that year. You know, you played 44 matches for a team that's finishing third and getting to the semi-finals of the the FA Cup, and then the following year it's sixth, the following year it's seventh. So the, these aren't flash in the pan. Um, Flashing the pan of currencies, but just taking it forward a couple of years. Then, so when you were twenty, so nineteen seventy six, seventy seven, you won Player of the Year as a as a fullback yeah. in the team, which has just finished third in the in the first division. And you said earlier about your playing style. I thought attacking fullbacks were a modern Jurgen Klopp. <laughs> it hadn't, I thought Jurgen Klopp invented those, didn't he? No, I mean, I mean, I the games progressed. There's no doubt about that. Uh, but formations, people think, oh, everybody used to play 4-4-2, everybody played the same way. No, that wasn't happening. As I say, Bobby Robson was, you know, in advance of his time, and so were the coaches, you know. And, for example, you know, way we, 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 we move things around, like Eric Gates. I mean, Bobby Ferguson loved Eric Gates, I did, but I know if he's doing them. But Eric Gates had some great qualities. But he wasn't just an ordinary midfield player. He was one of these who could score your goals, but maybe defensively wasn't great. But he was terrific with the ball to feet. So we are engineered a system with somebody playing off the strikers, you know, which, you know, it's like, well, never did that then. We started that years ago. So, we, you know, they were clever and clever the way we did it. We, we kept in front of people, you know, and we, we didn't have masses of squad, small squad. I looked at it, you know, you know, the other day, and I think from the UFA Cup or the squad, I think we'd nine, nine came through the, the youth system out of the 14, which is phenomenal. Coming through, the, you know, and playing in Europe every year, getting to cup finals, getting to quarter finals, semi finals. So, um, yeah, I think we we were well, well advanced, but I think the seat, the, the, what really stuck out for me, how we wanted to work together how we wanted to continue improving, you know, because, you know, you can do it maybe one season, but it's hard to keep it going. And um, under, you know, Sir Bobby and the staff and the players at that time, we did keep it going for a good 10 years. So, you know, you think you could have played wing back or these attacking fullbacks we see nowadays wouldn't have been an issue for yourself? One of my strengths, I think, was picking up and listening to things, you know, and Bobby and Ferguson and Cyril and Child said, well, you tell some players, you pick up quick. And I was always that type of player. I wanted to learn. And if you told me something, I would look at it and pick it up fairly quickly. Uh, my strength was going forward. So, um, you know, uh, and passing the ball because I practiced it. I loved to do it. Used to have, his, you know, I think his, um, Bobby Rob said, you know, every club in the back had a sand iron, I had a driver, I had a pitching wedge, and I had a lovely field because, like the coaching drills we used to do, every week we do it two or three times a week, and which I carry on doing it. And actually, I was talking to Tony Mowbray the other day and says, oh, Matt Venus keeps doing your coaching drills. He <laughs> loves it. And they're not doing too bad at the moment. No, they're not. Flying high. So, yeah. for me, it's repetition. And I've been, you know, learning coaches. Coaches, you've got to enjoy passing the ball. Enjoy it. If you don't get the players to enjoy passing the ball, oh, they've, oh, we've got, they've got to enjoy things. Enjoy training. Enjoy passing the ball. You know? And it's like communication. Com- communications in that way. You've got to train them to communicate with each other. It didn't just come. You know, you get players, you know, one of the strengths of your club, you've got players and you're making them better on the training ground. You know, and these days they're showing them on, you know, their laptops and all that. 
I still don't think it's the same as getting out in the training ground and actually doing it with them and stopping them and doing it. And the repetition, if I look at any other sport, repetition is key. Golf, tennis, whatever. So some players, oh, get, oh we're doing the same passing here. Yeah, you know, come on. You've got to re- do it all the time. Does Andy Murray moan about doing a forehand or a backhand? You know, a Tiger Woods hitting a drive, you know, for two or three hours after he plays. The repetition is so important to get it right. And even like crossing balls up, you know, I got a stage where I could do it in my sleep. I could find Johnny Walker in my sleep. It's rolled back to me. It's on Walker's head and it's 1-0. You know, I could do it in my sleep, you know. And then once I'm a manager and I'm looking at them, I'm thinking, <laughs> they can't do it. <laughs> they just can't do it because I've done it and done it. Yeah. You know, I think I keep saying the only player I felt was better at crossing the ball than me is when I worked with Gareth Bale. <laughs> That's me just been, you know, a bit cocky. But I, because I'd done it all the time, you know, it came easy. And that's where the repetition, repetition for players is so important. Yeah. Where well, it becomes second nature, doesn't it? I it is. You do it in your sleep. Yeah. So you having won the player of the year in 77, the guy that won it the following year was Mick Mills, the other left back, the left back on the other side. So. What was he like? You said about the you know, the team that came through together, but was he the glue that held it all together? Yeah, M- Mick's so mentally strong. Ah, uh, I mean, he's one of these players. He's, he's you know, his his focus is there. You know, whether he plays left back, right back, midfield, and Mick maybe wasn't the quickest. Maybe you know, passing the ball not long but short. But he had so much confidence, you know, there, and that gave the team confidence. Because you go out there and Mick says, yeah, we're going to win this and we might do some wrong, hey, some wrong, so what? Move on, you know? So so he was very shrewd, he was very focused and he was a really good captain because no matter the way things were going, Mick was there and said, come on, head up, bang, let's get it right. And um, so he was a terrific captain. So the following year, things tailed off a bit in the league, didn't they? 77, 78, we were finished relegation lost to Barcelona on penalties um in December um obviously we more than made up for that with the uh, with the FA Cup but before getting to the final were there any particular memories or matches in the run-up in the, in the cup run um obviously you know, we can talk about a certain goal at, at Millwall if you like in the in the quarter final but any any of the others um no um I mean we we struggled to get through um and the snow against um Bristol, Bristol Rovers. Yeah. I think Robin Turner Robin Turner ended up scoring. And we managed to get a replay play and get through, which you need in the cup, a little bit of luck. Uh the Millwall one certainly comes to mind, but probably the best best goal ever for Ipswich and of course <laughs> one in six and we were dodging bricks and stones yeah. on the way off. So that wasn't so good. Semi final was a terrific game. Um, at Highbury, where we won three one with um, Brian Talbot. I can keep seeing the blood coming around in his head, and and I was against Willie Johnson, and um, you know it was a game where it was going to be tough. Um, actually, I played golf oh, well, last year with Ron Atkinson, and Ron was the manager there, and he you know and he said to me after five minutes the ball got packed. Willie Johnson the ball and he knocked it past me, and I, I and, and it seemingly said he turned, he he ran past him, knocked it back the keeper, and Paul Cooper picked it up and, I, and he said from that minute I thought well, we're in trouble here, <laughs> and that was big road. So it was nice of um, him still remembering that day, and and I think the, you know I remember Johnny Watt scoring as well. I think that game, but I think it was that was a game where afterwards you're in such a high. Yeah. You know, you know you're getting to the final. You're travelling back in the coach with all the lads, and the whole, you know, the whole, you know, the bridges were blue and white. And then for the whole month after that, the whole town was blue and white, thinking about, yeah, we won the semis. We're we're going to Wembley, and that was it. In everybody was chasing tickets. Everybody's talking about it. Everybody wanted to go. Uh, that that month before it was phenomenal. And what your what your memories of the 
day itself or the lead up to the day itself, you know, s- staying nearby and yeah. getting to the ground and bits and pieces like that. Yeah, I mean, uh, we trained a little bit, I think the day before all that, it was, it was quite wet. It was, you know, on the, on the day it was sunny, but it was quite a heavy pitch. But I mean, I mean, from start to finish, we went on top, you know. Yeah. Um, played some great stuff, could have scored goals, remember, you know, my header. But one of a few headers that goes where Pat Jennings got this great big hand and knocked it away, and Johnny Watt hitting the bar and the cross, and Mar- Maris hitting the the post, I think, a bar, well on top, and um, you yeah. know, and it was great for Roger, Roger Osborne, who's who's a local lad, yeah. you know, salt to earth. Everybody loved Roger, such an honest lad, and and coming on and scoring, um, so that that was great for Suffolk. And for Ipswich and, uh, and and for Roger himself. Any particular celebrations afterwards? Or was it pretty low key? To be honest, everybody was shattered. Yeah. It was one of those. The semi final was different. You know, it was a different feeling. You know, yeah. We're, yeah, we're getting there. And I think there was so much emotion, and it was a heavy pitch, and you put so much into it. You know, yeah. we were back to the tail in London, and and really just a bit flaked out. You know, because uh, everybody, was, we got there, we won it, and and, it, and then you think, oh, oh, that was great. So the following years, then we signed a couple of Dutch guys. Um, I think after the FA Cup final, Arnold Muren, and the following season, Franz Tyson. How did how did things change from a playing style perspective, and how easy was it for the team to accommodate them? Yeah, I mean, you, you talked about how you developed as a player or whatever, but, you know, we were a team who we developed. And I remember Arnold saying after the first game, his neck was sore because the ball kept going over his head. So, you know, once you've got a player like Arnold and Franz, and, and Franz was a part, my partner, um, you, you, you changed your play, you, you developed it. Um, and there was a great, you know, all over the pitch, both teams, you had partners, and um, players you really work with, and you, you look at Arnold Muren uh, from there. He, you know, he made Alan Brazil a lot better player because Alan was great with the ball over the top. He was second to none, you know, finishing. So Arnold had that sandwich, you know, and his and his locker to just keep it up for Alan to run on him. And many times you've seen him slip slip it past the keeper. So that had to develop to get Arnold on the ball so he could develop Alan Brazil and other players to keep you playing. And the same with me with Franz Tyson. I mean, I, I played with, you know, with Brian, uh, Brian Hamilton and Roger Osborne and David Geddes in the final on the right, where Franz was one of these players, you just gave him the ball. There might, there might have been one or two players around him. You think, no, oh, give him the ball. Because he, he was so good at manipulating the ball, people couldn't get near him. He used to run at full pelt straight and he hooked the ball round with his foot and go in the opposite direction and the defender was still running. And he was fantastic. And I, that was great. And for me to be able to pass the ball, then go and join in, that was heaven for me. That that suited my play because I wanted to overlap all the time and I wanted to get forward quickly. And France and myself and and then you know Arnold and the other players they, they for, formed that great link. So we did adjust it compared to 78, that when the Dutch boys, you know, so Bobby and the coaching staff would change their play so that you, to get these boys on, you know, on in the game. So your players like, you know, those, those two and Eric Gates needed the ball to feet. So that's the way we played then. And so following year, I think we finished third again behind Liverpool and Manchester United and obviously en route beat the famous Manchester United 6-0 victory at, uh, at Portman Road. Um, you weren't involved in the escape to victory, George. You didn't fancy the uh, the Hollywood uh, glamour of the escape to victory trip in the summer of 1980? Well, well I could have done because uh, I was over with Scotland. We were over in Budapest and Johnny Work was going and asked me, do you want to go? And, you know, my wife was pregnant, um, my first son then. Um, so I don't think that went down too well. <laughs> but of course, all the stories I'm probably ever... Everybody's heard about Johnny Watt's story over there, where he, where he went there for four or five weeks with, um, you know, Paul Cooper and Russell and Carly and all the rest. And he had one line to say, I'll take the top bunk. 
And of course, Walker goes to cinema and we're all in one there, you know, whatever. And then he's listened to it and went, well, that's not my voice. <laughs> he spent five weeks and then they, they dubbed his voice. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, he got a few quid and had a good suntan after it, so he was quite happy. Yeah, they had a nice time, I think, didn't they? The the, the following season, obviously, is the 80-81 season. Um, you'd played 34 matches by the end of January and then come up against Shrewsbury in the FA Cup. Yep. Um, then, yeah, you, you got what was then a pretty pretty serious injury, didn't you? Yeah, it wasn't a good time for myself because I'd played... Hadn't really missed any games or yeah. such there. Played Shrewsbury in the cup. Um, I think it was quite a wet day. Uh, the ball bounced and it sort of skidded off the surface over the top. You know, and I sort of moved back the way and fell with my leg under me uh, from there. And I went down and, oh, yeah. To be honest, I never have treatment. <laughs> never had treatment. <laughs> you know, one of those players where I didn't want treatment, never did call it treatment, but I stayed down. And I thought, oh, that, that's there. So they came. So I got up. And we only had one sub um, to use then. We'd used yeah. it. So I had to carry on at the wing. And we played and we got drawn. Walkie kept passing me the ball. I said, Walkie, don't pass the ball. I couldn't move. I, well, my leg was all over the shop. So then afterwards, about four weeks went by, seen that space of nipsies and started. And when I kicked the ball, my knee was unstable, kept falling down. So um, at the time, Kevin Beatty had his problems and Kevin had went to Cambridge um, eventually to see a specialist and they told Kevin it was probably too late. So I went to that specialist who was recommended called Mr. David Dandy, who was renowned as one of the best knee surgeons in the world. Uh, he brought the arthroscope to this country. So he examined me in there and he went, well, your knee is very unstable. I think you've, you know, torn your major ligament and cartilage and, you know, anterior cruciate ligament as well. But I operate, I don't think you'll ever play football again. I've used um, carbon fibres. Um, I've stopped doing that. I was do, you know, so we just cut your, half of your patella tendon away to replace it. So, got it done. You can imagine how I felt and go back in the car with my wife. But uh, my wife, you know, said, well, she, you know, you never know. So, I had it done. Um, it was, you know, he, he thought, torn cruciate ligament, medial ligament there. So, he rep- repaired it all, put me in a, in a, a plaster, bent plaster in Cambridge in the evening nursing home. And, um, you know, and of course I was there you on know, a wire. So, so actually the, t- the team, the team were playing in the Midlands. Um, I think it was against Nottingham Forest. Um, and that, and the evening after, you know, I had the operation. So I'm laying there and all of a sudden I hear this bus pulling up and people jumping out. And I thought, where's that noise coming from? And I thought, oh. That sounds like Maris. That sounds like Paul Maris. And the boys, door flashes open. I'm laying there. I've got a big plaster on. I've got tubes come out of my leg. There's blood all over it. And I'm laying there. Hey, yeah, Maris. Oh, how are you doing? And he had this blow up doll over his shoulders. <laughs> and I'm looking. I'm, you know, there. Ah, oh, And he sits it down to in the chair next to me. And I'm lying with a plaster and blood coming everywhere. And I'm wondering, and I don't think I'm ever going to play. I had to <laughs> smile. And all the boys stayed for 10, 20 minutes and said, oh, I'm off. And I'm thinking, what are you going to do with that doll? So the boys go go off in the coach. And all I could see these little nurses peeking their head going, Hoo-hoo-hoo-hoo. I thought, Joe, yeah, well, come back quickly. you know. And Joe said, maybe we should go back. I said, well, I'm not going to carry that blow-up doll out of the hospital, am I? <laughs> but so that... So um, eventually I'm out of hospital. I see um, Mr. Dandy's um, physio called Harry Willis, who was a top physio. He said, I'll get you playing again. I went, wow. yep, you stay with me. Nobody else is going to touch your knee. I don't want you going back to the club. You're staying with me every day up at Cambridge, five days a week, and we'll get you fit. So I was in plaster for two months. I came out and it take, took me another six weeks to get my legs straight. 
and I worked every day. I, you know, it was a difficult time for me, but I was determined to give it ever, everything I got. And eventually got fit. You know, it got me fit. I went swimming. I went to athletics coach. I had treatment for four, three, four hours every day going to Cambridge. And um, I was out for eight, nine months. Yeah. So <laughs> I got there eventually. And even now, they're, they're eight, nine months. And I was the first person to come back from a torn cruciate ligament. So it was a difficult time. The boys were great. But I had to concentrate on getting myself fit, otherwise finished. I was 25, 26 year old. And then um, I put the work in. I had a great physio, great specialist. And um, I managed to play till I was 39. That's remarkable, isn't it? Because, yeah, you were you were 24 when you had the injury. And as yeah. you say, it was, should have been a career-ending injury. Yes. You, went on, you went on to play another 350 times after yeah. that, which just goes to show, you know, a combination of... Yeah. The hard work you put in and, and the medical guys is phenomenal at that at that point in time, wasn't it, really, back then? Yeah, I was the first one and um, I got to World Cup finals in 82. Yeah, uh, I was never able to bend my knee further back. So it wasn't, you know, so I, well, I had to develop it. I couldn't, I still can't bend my knee further back. Um, but <laughs> it's like anything, you know, you've got, your body's got to adjust to it. Uh, yeah. So maybe it wasn't, it wasn't when you have an operation it's not as good as it was before but you know you've got to work double hard you know i never used to do a lot of weights i had to do a lot of weights i learned how to do the weights which got me stronger my legs my upper body you know so you, you try and compensate for it after every game i couldn't stand up because it, fl- it filled up with fluid so i used to have two or three days off to get the fluid down before i train again so i had to live with it i had to manage the knee you know so if i didn't manage the knee it get too swollen, so I couldn't play. So <laughs> you, your body's got to adjust, and you've got to adjust to it. And then through, you know, being very focused in life to get that right, I managed to do it. Well, as you say, you know, you, and you played in the World Cup the following summer. You, you were out until November, and then played every game from that November onwards into the summer of '82. Yeah. Um, as you say, so what were your experience? You're at the World Cup in Spain, as you say. Um, you were there with John Walk and Alan Brazil were also in yeah. the squad, weren't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. You had three guys over the England squad as well. Uh-huh. Um, any particular, well, not necessarily memories of that World Cup, but international involvement in general. They had a hell of a team, Scotland, at that time, didn't they? Yeah, yeah. Um, people are, always ask me who was the best player I played against. And, they would, you know, it would be Diego Maradona. He played, you know, which maybe is not too Yeah, popular, heard of him. Yeah. Basically, Terry Butcher. De- Terry Butcher. <laughs> Bless them. Um, yeah, 1981, I went at uh, Hamden. Uh, he was fin- absolutely fantastic. You know, he was so quick and strong, whatever. So, you know, you come against them and watching Brazil, the, Brazil beat Scotland 4 1. They were a fantastic team. So it was a great experience and to be involved in the World Cup and play against people like that, Maradona and that. Yeah, it was. I mean, you're talking about the tops, and it? it doesn't get any better. That's right. You know, it didn't get any better for me from my debut and, and, and being involved in the World Cups. So, so I've been very fortunate. And uh, as you say, it could have been different if if I didn't have the specialist to get my knee right. Then after a pl- after games, I had to be really, you know, with the fluid in my knee and adjusting my body to it. That wouldn't happen. So you know, I've been very lucky. I've been very lucky in my life. So. Once um, 1982 was the World Cup, so Ron Green was in charge of England at the time, and he left, and obviously Sir Bobby left to take up that position. Um, and then you start to just see players starting to drift away and, and sign for other clubs. I think Arnold Muren left that summer. Then the following season, Mick Mills, Brazil, Tyson. And as a result, the league positions start to just drift away as well, don't they? Yeah, I think every team um, you know, comes to a point where people go and, you know, you look at some Alec Ferguson with, with Man you know, and it was the same way Ipswich. And then when your manager goes, things change as well. So that, that's the case. And, and, you know, it's not always the right decision for players, but I think when you get to a period where you've been for, you know, over, you know, a lot, a lot of the players had 10 years, 12 years, um, they move on, move on and um, try and 
you know, look at different things. And that, that's the way it always happens. Uh, but I mean, I don't think you're ever going to get to Ipswich where with eight or nine testimonials <laughs> these days, it's two or three years to get yeah. sort of seven or eight players who have had 10 years service is phenomenal. And I don't think it would ever happen again. No. Well, and, and yeah, so we had, let's say, Mills, Brazil, Tyson left. And then the following season, Mariner and Walk sort of left pretty close to each other, didn't they? I think there's a bit in, I've been reading Paul Mariner's book and he's talking yeah. about them both handing in transfer fees, like <laughs> meet, meeting up and deciding a, a master plan to get more money, which, uh, which uh, sort of worked for them. Um, but then 20, you were 28, in 1984, 1985, we finished 17th, but you had 50 appearances that year, but we lost in the semi-final of the Milk Cup, as it was in time, the League Cup, as it is really. Um, I think that's the first time I've ever cried, or first and only actually time I've ever cried. I was only about eight years old, and <laughs> Steve Bruce scored, didn't he, in the, in the away leg to uh, put them through to Wembley. But I was looking at it. You had four matches in eight days, and you played in each one of those. You played Chelsea, Sheffield Wednesday, Norwich, and Everton. Yeah. In four, all those in, in, the space of, in the space of eight days, it was pretty hard going. Unfortunate for us that that Norwich match fell in the middle of those games, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, used to, you know, the Easter period and other periods used to play a lot of games. And the pitches were so heavy. Yeah. yeah but the, you know, the fibre sand they have these days keeps it firm. But uh, in those days it was firm. But we did it. I mean, um, I mean, it, it's it's amazing. We didn't have a sports science to tell you you shouldn't be playing. Or you yeah. shouldn't be doing that. These days, they'll look at look at your performance and that, thinking, oh no, he's he's you know his energy's running out. He might you know he might get injured. You didn't have that then, which I suppose it could be a good or a bad thing. But we we got on with it and played, and you know, and you think you know, if you're a fit lad, you, you know, you can re- recover. But then you hear it, you hear it even now, don't you? That players would far, far more play games than they would train, wouldn't they? Yeah, it's not ideal. I mean, you know, you may you may not be quite sharp. You know, you yeah. still got a wee bit heavy legged or whatever from if you're playing in such a small uh, space, space of three or four games. But um, yeah, that, that was the the fixtures. You know, you know what you're going to do, and that that was um, how you had to do it then. Um, sometimes here uh, at the moment um, because of you know, the way the, f- the fixtures are structured if you get one or two cried off they, ha- they have got to play two or three games in maybe a week but um, that's something you- you've got to live with and then 1985 you moved up to Sunderland and you were 29 years old when you left you- but you still played another 200 times after you left after you left Ipswich um, did you have any other chances to move elsewhere before Sunderland came in? No, I mean, I mean, I was I was happy with Ipswich, but you yeah. know, when, when you have a number of players that move away, and I came from when I was fifteen, I had my testimonial when we played against Aberdeen, and you know, and there was you know a lot of changes going on, and actually thinking, well, maybe for the future, if I move somewhere, it would um, help, and and I was looking to get into the coaching side as well. Um, so that, that that was the first time, and I mean, I remember speaking to Southampton um, before um, Sunderland. Uh, that didn't come about, and um, Eric Gates had went to Sunderland and des- decided to go there. Um, I say then you had a short spell at, at Gillingham and Motherwell and Air, um, where you well we'll talk about this talk about that later when you you start to make that change into into management yes but just taking it back to the to the squad i think i can't remember i read somewhere that sir bobby sort of said he had three teams in that he had his 1975 team his 1978 team and his 1981 team is there a, a would you say there's a better or a best group of players during your time at ipswich is it definitely the 81 team i mean how do you class class better yeah um, I always say that a manager's, um, you know, um, results are the primary you know, importance. Um, of course, you want to play football, but um, yeah, everybody wants to play football. So I think you've got to look at results um, as far as league and that concerned, and resources. Uh, Ipswich has never had never had much resources, so Bobby didn't, and um, so so they say difficult, different altogether. From a technical point of view, of course, bringing the Dutch boys in, 
um, it improved it that way. Um, yeah. There's no doubt about that. And I think uh, from the spectators to watch, um, when you brought the Dutch lads in, uh, I think um, it was it was better to watch. But you still can't take away from the 78 team, which was different, you know, in the 75. So um, they're, they're all good because they all had good results. And to keep it up in the top 36 over those years was fantastic. So just in terms of, you said about um, not having the resources. You know, Sir Bobby famously only signed 18 players in those yeah. 13 years he was in charge. So in terms of, and, and Paul Mariner talks about it in, in the book, the camaraderie and the team spirit. You know, you guys must have just almost been like brothers because there was such little change from year to year that it was a, a very large core of players who, who went through together. And, you know, you're still all friends to this day, aren't you? with the reunions and bits and pieces like that. Yeah, I mean, as I said previously, you know, when you look at the squad, the number coming through the youth policy yeah. was uh, fantastic. But you've got to look at um, Bobby's record of signing players. Because, um, you know, when he, he saw Brian Talbot, I think Brian was a you know, really good player for his great energy. Um, and they brought Murin and Tyson in. Um, I think Brian went for about four hundred and fifty thousand, and Muir and Tyson came from came for about three fifty, four hundred, you know. And they, you know, and, and he swapped, you know, John Pedelity and, and Terry Austin for for Paul Mariner. Um, so I mean, that's fantastic. But the basic crux of it was the youngsters, and Bobby always wanted to do that. That's why coming at a, a really young age, the club couldn't do enough for him because Bobby realised. You know that 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 was going to be the, you know, probably his best players, and where most of the players are going to get into the first team if if they were going to succeed, and um and 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 that structure worked really well, and they had just added one or two to it, and then of course all the work in the training field. So it it's not just one little area. It's um great great youth policy, working hard in the training ground to make them better, and bringing in. Uh, players which are, are going to improve you. In terms of your playing career, you said about Maradona being a difficult opponent. Are there any you know, British-based opponents that you know you thought, "Crikey, we've got whoever at the weekend." This might be a might be a tricky one. Yeah, um, actually, I watched um, Brian Clough and Netflix and all that, and there was Good Food Forest and John Robertson. Um, he loved John, and John was a very difficult player to play against because he was clever. You know, he, he was intelligent, he could come short, he could go inside, he could go outside. Um, wasn't the quickest, um, but he moved the ball quickly. They played some good football. You had people like Tony Woodcock running in behind you. So so people like John Robertson were very you know, difficult because somebody, if somebody's just quick, you've maybe given them a yard. Or, yeah. or one-footed, you say, I know he's going one way. John had had the had the lot as far as being intelligent, using the ball, coming and joining in, going left, going right, and um, he 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 yeah, he he was very successful on a very good Nottingham Forest side. Fantastic. And by the same token, are there any players you played with, and, and any non-obvious ones? Yeah, maybe that you thought would make it big or to international level, and and didn't. Not necessarily just at Ipswich, but over the over your whole playing career. Uh, I mean, when I, when I was player, was, if you look at um, the squad, it was 14 internationals. <laughs> so you can't say that none of them, you know, you know, underachieved because actually, I think even Kevin Callan when he came was an you know, international, and he, Kevin, you know, was more a sub than he played, and he was an <laughs> excellent winger. So we better, we better pick Paul Cooper then, yeah, better we? Well, Coops, yeah, <laughs> yeah, well, he's. Yeah. He definitely, I mean, when you look at now, he would be even better because when you did your practice and your, your passing drills, Coops was one of the best. Yeah. And we, he had a lovely left foot, you know, you could spray it about in there. I mean, when you watch, you know, the football then, the big difference is you used to be able to pass it back to keep and they picked it up. <laughs> so if you're under <laughs> pressure, if you watch the cup final, it picks it up. Yeah. So you think, and then you kick it, you know, so you could waste a lot of time, but not now. But as I say, Paul Cooper, with his feet, was tremendous. So he would be even better. But Paul wasn't tall, but he had great spring. 
and and I can see you think, well, do I gamble to go quickly? I knew Paul was going to catch it. As soon as Paul's catch it, he knew I was going to be vicks on the halfway line and then whoosh. So that, that worked as a counter attack from the goalkeeper. You know, so you see that going on for a bit. Paul, you know, was very unfortunate not to get an international cap. Get a couple of decent keepers ahead of him, though, didn't he? I suppose Shorten and Clements of that. Season. Yeah, well, <laughs> very difficult. I mean, that was the problem. You know, we had talked about like Richard Wright, Richard Wright, who's international, uh, went to Arsenal. I wanted him to stay, but he had a, a figure in his contract. He could move, and then he goes to Arsenal. David Seaman, who he thought was going to retire, didn't retire. Hardly played for a, a game for two years and didn't get any football. And Richard at 21 was a full international Ipswich, you know, and he was a big loss. So um, that, that shows you that, um, you know, it's very important that you can get there, but if you make the, the wrong move, it can sort of stumble your, your career. Yeah, perfect. Well, I think we're almost done, but, you know, we, we can't really not talk about Sir Bobby just in general. Obviously, you've been you know, talking about him all the way through, but... As I said before, I've just finished play, um, reading Paul Mariner's book, and as expected, you know he couldn't speak any any higher of, of the guy in terms of not just as a player, but actually after retirement. Um, and he's not the only ex-player to say the same. You know, to a man, you all you all do. Uh, what, what was his what were his main attributes as a manager? Paul Mariner talks about his detail and, and preparation, but his man management was second to none, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, uh, I spoke about what he did uh, in my debut. Yeah. Um, for me, it was his enthusiasm. I mean, when you walk into a room with Bobby, or oh, there, bang, he's off. You know, he's talking about football. He's excited, and everybody stands up. To, you know, and listens to him. You know, I think coaching you know, left a lot to the other coaches or, or, or on the training ground. Because it's important, you know, when you get old as a manager, it's better you step back and have a wee look at it. As a younger, you want to do everything. But it's good time you there. But his enthusiasm for games and he hated losing, you know, and he, he just wants you to go out there and give it everything, you know, give it everything in the training ground. He wants you to be lively and sparky and, and be, be totally focused to get better. Um, and his knowledge of the game, We've talked about the way he played, you know, 75, 78. Knowledge of the game, how to adjust to players. You know, when you've got a squad of players, you, you know, you, it's not black and white. You've yeah. got to adjust to them, you know, and he's seen so much, even in Portman Road, you know, that you got good players and whatever, but you haven't adjusted to it. You've got to adjust to get the right coordination between people to play. And that's what Bobby did. He, his signings were fantastic and the way he developed his teams. So he thought, all oh, right, that's got to change. All right, we'll put, you know, Eric Gates there and that there or get Tyson Muir in there. So he adjusted his team. Oh, how are we going to get better when I've got the job? I've got to go get this youth policy right, bring the best young players in as we can, treat them well, let's let's promote them, give them a chance, you know. You know, make them improve, and that was all the way through. And Ipswich, he did that, which was phenomenal. And he had good coaches in that, and yeah. you know, we he made it fun in there. And always, every pre season, we would go on tour, and end of seasons, we used to go on tour. You know, he'd take us to, I think, he went to Hawaii and and Israel and all that. And you know, and the, and the coaches were good, and we we had some laughs and that. And the characters and you know, Bobby Ferguson was a character. And, I remember when we went to Israel and Bobby, Bobby loved the sun and he, he was there and he used to do his karate against the waves and the boys used to laugh on that. And then, you know, he's, we were having dinner and Bobby said, oh, to, I think it was Brian Simpson, the physio. Brian, I've had too much sun. Is there anything you can give me for it? He said, well, there's some cal- calamine lotion there, you know. So fine. So Bobby takes it up to the room and he comes down in the morning and says, Oh, Brian, I feel bad. What about I said, that calamine lotion tasted rubbish. It made me a bad stomach. <laughs> <laughs> so the boys were going, he didn't drink it. Oh. So, but, I mean, we had, we had great characters and, you know, you're talking about big characters in the dressing room, you know, Maris and Boots and, you know, so there, Alan, Alan and the Beat, 
So, you know, we we big characters and, and really uh, people who wanted to, to work hard to win games. But, that, but that's not created by accident, is it? You know, having those particular characters who, you know, blend in a certain way, that's that's a skill in management in it in itself, isn't it? it most important, yeah. most important, because a group of players means nothing if they're not, you know, playing to their strengths. And Bobby used to do what you're good at, you know, and then he he would organise it there. You know, you've so, seen so many squads, you're thinking, that's not right. This balance is not right. So, that, you know, it's like a jigsaw puzzle and th- people think it's easy. You know, I think, oh, well, that, can you just do that, do that? It, it's not like that. Football's not like that. You've got to be able to get players who are going to work together in whatever formation. And there's not a bad formation. The formation is right for that squad, might not be right for the other squad. So, so Bobby managed to work that one out for, for his squad of players. And that player that com- comes in will do a job there. So um, it's yeah, it's not black and white. It's um, you've got to have, for me, you've got to have the eye for it, the eye for a player, the eye for saying that system's not right for that or what he's doing it wrong. You know, and you can have all the computers and all the stats you do, but unless you've got that eye, trained eye for players and and done it on the training ground, we were a passing team. So what did we do for training? We did loads and loads of passing. And that was, I think, when people watched Epstein's Town, were good passers of the ball because we did it, you know, it's, you know, doing it week in, day out, doing it all the time. Well, talk of Sir Bobby's management will lead us nicely into our next chat in your next phase, the next phase of your career, um, the management side of things. So for the time being, many thanks for your time, George. It's been absolutely fantastic. And as I say, the next time chat will be about the management side of things.